Hello everybody, and welcome back to my basement. I am here to finish lecture two for our longitudinal class discussing interaction terms. If this set of slides seems like it's kind of overwhelming, that's because it is. But I wanted you to see the general logic of how to approach these sorts of model interpretations. And then this semester we'll get the chance to see numerous examples that actually implement these strategies. So hang in there. It does get better with practice. So I'm going to start on slide 29 just to give us a context for the rest of what I have to cover. The idea of interpreting slopes in the context of the rest of the model. So we all know what a slope is. A slope is the difference in y for a one unit difference in x, or a change in y for a one unit change in x. How to then describe conceptually what that effect represents is what the rest of this slide is about. And so these are words that I'm not going to say I invented, but that may not be common across disciplines. These are my ways of describing three different ways to interpret a slope bivariate marginal, which is when the slope is the only slope in the model. So it describes the full relationship between a predictor, let's say x, and an outcome y. There's unique marginal, which means that there are multiple slopes in the model such that they have to compete with each other. And each slope represents the unique effect of that predictor after controlling for all the other predictors. So each predictor only gets credit for its individual contribution to the prediction that is not shared with the other slopes. That's what I mean by the word unique. The marginal part, though, applies when the slope is not part of an interaction term, when the predictor that the slope is for is not also part of an interaction term, meaning that the slope applies equally across the sample. And then finally, unique conditional is the case in which a predictor has not only what we call a main effect, meaning the effect of the predictor by itself, but it is also involved in an interaction term, in which case its effect becomes conditional on each other variable that it interacts with. So that's what we've been talking about here. So to illustrate these things, for instance, the slope of beta 1 for the effect of w here, this is bivariate marginal because it's all by itself. The effect applies to everybody. Here, because each of these predictors is not involved in an interaction term, they all have marginal effects. So beta 1 is the slope for w for everybody. Beta 2 is the slope for x for everybody. And each of these is controlling for whatever collinearity or covariance they have um, amongst themselves. The situation where we introduce unique conditional comes down here. So in this case, we've added a single interaction term between x and z. So w, who is not involved in the interaction term, still has a unique marginal effect, whereas those of x and z become conditional. So the slope of x given by beta 2 is only for cases in which z is 0, because that's when this latter interaction term would drop. Likewise, the slope of z here, beta 3, is only for cases in which x is 0, because that's when the last term would drop. And so each of these beta 2 and beta 3 slopes is conditional in the context of this model. The interaction term, however, is marginal, because there is only one slope that deals with the combination of x and z. So this is the interaction term for everybody. That's what I mean by marginal. So then in terms of how we talk about the coefficient that beta 4 is to become, rather than talking about the effect of beta 4 on the intercept or the expected outcome directly, we want to talk about it in terms of what it does to the other slopes. So beta 4's job is to moderate the slope of beta 2 as a function of z. It's also supposed to moderate beta 3 as a function of x. So beta 4 does two things at the same time. It's a two-way interaction, which means that either of these interpretations as to which is the moderator is equally correct. In practice, one tends to make more sense or align with your research questions more directly. So in order to determine how the model would then predict the effect of x and the effect of z, no matter what the values of those predictors are, we have two steps to follow. 
we first go into the equation and find all of the terms related to the predictor whose effect we're trying to compute. So for instance, if I want to know the effect of x, then I need beta 2, and I also need beta 4 because x is involved in those terms. So that brings us down here. If I factor x out, because that is the variable I'm trying to create the slope for, it goes to the end, and the slope of x is given by this linear combination of beta 2 plus beta 4 times z. So in order to talk about the slope of x, I have to know for whom in terms of its interacting predictor z. And this shows a little more clearly, I think, why we have to interpret beta 2 as the effect of x specifically when z is 0, because that's when the second term drops and that's all there is. The same logic would give us the simple slope, the model implied effect for z. We pull out the terms that have z in them, bring them down, so we have beta 3 and beta 4. We factor out z, bring it to the end, and now this linear combination, beta 3 plus beta 4x, is how we get the slope for any value of x for the z predictor. And all of these can be requested as part of your model syntax, so we will get a chance to practice that this semester. In terms of describing the pattern of moderation, it is insufficient to say, you know, x is moderated by z, right? That doesn't tell you what the direction is, what's actually happening. So I want to introduce my framework for interpreting what an interaction term is actually doing. To me, there's only four kinds. Every interaction term takes its constituent main effects and either makes them more positive, less positive, more negative, or less negative. So if it's making a slope more positive or more negative as a function of the interacting predictor, as a function of the moderator, I would say that it is strengthening the effect. So this is known as an over-additive interaction. It's like a bonus if you're high on both kind of idea. Um, if the direction is that the interaction term is making its main effect slope less positive or less negative, then it's a weakening effect. It's, it's diminishing the effect. And what's known as an under-additive interaction, you don't get as big of a boost as you would expect if you're, at, if you're high on both. So it's more of a, a compensatory kind of idea, I think, as in other literatures as it would be called. So just to illustrate what I would mean, if this is my model, so the effect of w is marginal, so we're going to ignore that and just focus on what happens as a function of this beta 4 interaction term to the slope of x. So we'll just go one way to make it um, a little bit st more straightforward. So if I think of the slope of x as what I care about and beta, beta excuse me, z that's attached to beta 3 is my moderator. So if I found that beta 2 is 10 and I found that beta 4 is 2, then what I would say is that the interaction term is taking my slope of x and making it more positive by 2 for every unit of z. So the slope of x would be 10 if z is 0. If z goes to 1, it would become 12. So the interaction term is strengthening the effect of x, more positive. The opposite would be true if the slope for x is 10, but the interaction term is negative. So in this case, the interaction term is making the effect of x less positive, meaning that when z is 0, the slope of x is 10, but if z is 1, the slope of x is 8. So it's reducing the effect of x. More negative would look like the third row. So in this case, the effect of x is getting stronger, because more negative does mean stronger. If you had as z of 0, the slope of x would be minus 10. If you had a z of 1, the slope of x would be minus 12. And then last is the less negative combination, where I have a negative slope of x, a positive interaction term, so the effect of x becomes less negative by 2 for every unit increment in z. So every interaction term is going to fall into one of these four cases. You just have to look at the pattern of the signs to know how to interpret it. When there's more than one interaction, though, it gets a little tricky. So there was a question in class about this, and I promised I had a slide. Turned out it was a few more slides later than what I had anticipated. I am opening a can of soda to get through this slide. So now we have interactions between x and z as before, but we've added w and z. So z is part of two different interaction terms at the same time. 
So all three of our main effect slopes, beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3, are unique conditional, but what they're conditional on has changed for beta 3. So the slope of w is specific to when z is 0 because of this beta 5 interaction term. The slope of x is specific to when z is 0 because of the beta 4 interaction term we had previously. But now the effect of z is specific to both w equals 0 and x equals 0 because z is involved in both of these interaction terms. To then talk about the interaction slopes, we would say it one of two ways. So beta 4 describes how the effect of x changes by z or how the effect of z changes by x. Beta 5 similarly describes how the effect of w changes by z or how the effect of z changes by w. Take your pick. To be able to determine how the model would predict the slope for any of these three variables given their interaction terms, we follow the same rules as before. So what do you want the slope for? For instance, if it's w, okay, go up to the model, find all the stuff that has w in it, pull it down. So I've got the main effect of w here, which is the simple main effect when z is 0, plus how it's moderated by z. If I factor out w, I'm left with this term. Similar logic, if I want the effect of x, it's involved in two terms, factor out x, and this is what I'm left with. z, though, is involved in two different interaction terms, so they both have to contribute. So the effect of z is a function of all three terms. It's simple main effect when the other two predictors are zero, how the z effect changes by x, and how the z effect changes by w. So it's the same logic, just with an extra term involved. For predictors that are quantitative variables, you can also um, compute something that's known as regions of significance. I talk about this in chapter two, and I think we'll have some examples of that this semester. And that is the idea of trying to figure out what are the boundary values at which the effect of a predictor is either negative, not significant, or positive. So uh, that is a useful thing if the values that you would fill into these equations are somewhat arbitrary. For categorical predictors, the same logic holds, but you just have to keep track of all of the individual terms that are necessary to distinguish the levels of the categorical variable from each other. So for instance, if I have a four category group as before, we had control and treatment one, two, and three, and I want to know if group interacts with age. So conceptually, that's one interaction term, right? Group by age. Mathematically, it is three, because group takes three different predictors to fully distinguish it. So in a model that has simple main effects for group would have three slopes to distinguish each of the treatment groups from control as the reference, which is zeroed out here as the first column. It also has to have a simple main effect of age if I want to add the interaction term because all the lower order effects have to be there for the interaction term to be interpreted correctly. But then I have three interaction terms because each of my dummies, dummy code variables, excuse me, has to interact with age. So then beta five describes how the effect of age differs in the treatment one group versus control. Beta six describes how the effect of age differs in treatment two versus control and beta seven describes how the effect of age differs in treatment three versus control. So to get a significance test of whether there is an interaction conceptually of group by age, it's all three of these. So this is another example of when we would use a multivariate walled test. If we're using denominator degrees of freedom, which is usually a good idea, that would be an F. If we were not, it would be a chi-square. A uh, chi-square divided by the number of slopes you've lumped together gets you to F. So it's the, the same test statistic either way, but the p-value would be from a chi-square distribution or an F distribution, depending on which one you're doing. Um, keeping in mind the main effect slopes here are simple main effects, so the group differences given by beta 1, 2, and 3 are specific to an 85-year-old. Likewise, the main effect of age that's given by beta 4 here is the simple main effect specifically in the control group 
because that's when these three interaction terms would be zeroed out, is if each of these dummies goes to zero, if you're talking about control. So it's the same logic. A predictor main effect slope is conditional on all of the predictors that it interacts with being zero. And even though we've centered everything relative to age 85, we can figure out what the group differences would be at any age. We can also figure out what the age slope would be in any group because we've got the ingredients here. So just to illustrate how that would work, here's what we would end up with if we wanted to know how to get the effect of age in any of the groups. So we go up to the model, we pull out all the terms that have age in them because that's what we care about. We factor age out and then this is what's left. So if it's the control group, all three of the interactions would be zeroed out because that's how we created these three dummy variables. They're all zero when we're talking about control, which makes it our reference. The effective age in treatment one would be whatever the effective age is in control with beta four plus how it differs of treatment one versus control that's given by beta five. So these beta five, beta six, and beta seven terms are differences in the slope of age between groups. So to get to what it is in that group, we start with the reference and then add how it difference, differs to get to the target group. Likewise, <laughs> we can get group differences at any age. So we have the difference between control and treatment, which is D1. That starts off with beta 1 for what it would be when age is 85, and then beta 5 as the moderator, so you'd fill in whatever age you want that for. Similar pattern to get to control versus treatment 2 and control versus treatment 3. So if you then want the differences among the non-reference groups, so treatment 1 versus 2 for instance, they are linear combinations of these linear combinations. So it looks like this. So rather than reading these to you, I will say this is where you should pause the video and work out the math to see if you can follow it. But you're literally taking these compound terms, for instance, for treatment two, and then subtracting treatment one to get to how the uh, groups compare for any age for the non-reference groups. So this is a, maybe a little bit overkill, but the point I'm trying to make is that even though your centering strategy, making control the reference group and making age 85 the reference for age, locks you into what these simple main effects mean, the model still tells you what they would be for any level of the interacting predictor as a linear combination of the fixed effects. You just have to know how to ask for it. And then finally, because that wasn't fun enough, what about three-way interactions? And yes, we will have those this semester. So if I pick up another two-way interaction term so that I can fit the three-way interaction among all of these variables, then the strategy that I use for interpreting it has to change. So if I look at what happens to beta 1, 2, and 3, those are simple main effects that make the outcome higher or lower. So they each have one possible interpretation and they're each conditional on all of their interaction terms being zero. So conditional on zero for the other two predictors in this case because they're each involved in two-way interaction and in the three-way. Now previously, what we referred to as two-way interactions that were marginal, they are now conditional as well. So x by z, for instance, because of this three-way interaction is specific to w zero. w by z is specific to x zero x by w is specific to z0. And so then how we talk about what the three-way interaction does is it takes each of the two-way interactions and it changes it as a function of the third variable. So for instance, this x by z interaction beta 4, as w increases, is going to become more negative, less negative, more positive, or less positive. Set it in a different order just for fun. It's still the same logic. There's still only four things that can happen, but it's what they happen to. So the, the three-way interaction takes each of the two ways and makes them moderated by the third variable. Each of the two ways then 
is moderate uh, moderates the main effect slopes by the other variable. So it's like a, a trickle down sort of system. And just because I can, I'm going to show you what it would look like to then ask for the simple main effect for each of these three predictors that's involved in the three two-way interactions and the three-way. So for instance, W, go up to the model, find all the terms that have W in them, bring them down, factor the W out, and this is what you're left with. The effect of W is whatever it is for the reference, which is when these other terms zero out, plus how Z changes it, plus how X changes it, and plus how X by Z change it combined as the three-way interaction. Likewise, the effect of X, go to the model, find all the X's, pull them down, factor it out, and this is what you're left with, same pattern for Z. So in order to describe each of the main effects here that I'm interested in, all of the terms that moderate them have to be included. Otherwise, you're holding them to zero. Likewise, we now have what we would call simple two-way interactions, which, God, if that's not an oxymoron. What I mean by simple is just conditional. You can't talk about the x by z interaction as applying to everybody because it only applies to w equals zero. So for instance, if I want to know how I would get the x by z interaction for any person, it's beta 4, it's simple two-way interaction when w is zero, plus how the three-way interaction changes the two-way interaction as a function of w. Same thing for w by z, what it is, plus how x moderates it, and then for x, what it is, x by w, excuse me, what it is, and then how z moderates it. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to end up with any three-way interaction homeworks, but I have given one. Uh, the Scrabble homework that some of you are familiar with was originally a three-way interaction homework that described uh, how the effect of verbal ability when playing uh, more difficult opponents, how the difference in the effect of verbal ability when playing more difficult opponents depended on your spatial ability. That was the original story that created that homework, so just as an FYI. Alright, so summary then. Interaction terms are tricky, but the main idea is that they say that the effect of a predictor depends on other predictors. That's the idea of, mo of uh, moderation via interaction terms. And the interaction terms that we have here are a particular flavor of moderation because it's a linear moderation. There's other possibilities as well. You just have to keep in mind in looking at the slopes, what are they part of? If they're not part of an interaction term, then you can talk about the slope as applying to everybody after controlling for all the other variables. That's unique marginal. If the slope um, has a predictor that is part of an interaction term, it's conditional on all the interaction terms being zero. So then we can talk about the main effects as making the predicted outcome higher or lower. We can then talk about the two-way interaction terms as making the main effects more or less positive or negative. Three-way interaction terms take the two-way interaction terms and make them more or less positive or negative by the third variable. And we could do it for four-way interactions too. I believe that's where I ended up in chapter two. So have fun with that if you get the chance. So big picture summary for this lecture. My goal here was to start putting some terminology onto ideas that you already have. So you already know how to talk about slopes. You already know how to do significance tests. But I'm going to need to add additional vocabulary to distinguish this process that happens to fixed effects from a parallel process that's going to happen to random effects. So what you know of as regression slopes and intercepts are fixed effects. They belong in the model for the means. None of this has to do with the model for the variance yet. Some of the output that you get will look different because sums of squares are no longer a thing. We will be using likelihood estimation, residual maximum likelihood estimation, which is pronounced REML as the acronym, or instead of ML, or ML. Uh, key points to take with you, we can test individual slopes for significance using T or possibly Z. We can test multiple slopes at the same time, such as the idea of testing the overall model, 
such as the idea of testing changes in r square from adding multiple slopes at the same time, such as the idea of omnibus tests of the effective group that take more than one uh, contrast to be able to fully delineate the differences between all the groups. Uh, all predictors should have a meaningful zero. So if it's a categorical predictor, some groups got to be the zero and other groups are going to be the ones. And if it is a quantitative variable, it, zero just needs to be somewhere in there that makes sense. If you have a predictor that zero is already meaningful, maybe it's a count of the number of things that people have done where they could do nothing and that's an option, then don't center it. Zero is meaningful in that case and that's fine. It's just in the situation in which zero is far away from the range of variability that the predictor has that we can run into problems. So zero somewhere within the range of the predictor is good. Um, in terms of representing ca categorical predictors, there's two different ways to do that. Um, one is less typing, but is more convoluted to interpret potentially because you're not the one setting up the coding scheme. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. And finally, even though once you add interaction terms, the simple main effects are specific to the interacting variables being zero, through the magic of algebra and linear combinations, we can figure out what the slope would be for any level of the interacting predictors, and we can make it get estimated by the software so that we get not only its value, but also its standard error and thus a significance test. So stay tuned for that which you will get a chance to practice starting Thursday. So thanks for listening. I hope to see you all tomorrow.